see your baby at me? Click. <laughs> yes, can you see yourself? Hello everyone. Um, we are back for part two of talking about our diagnosis and journey after finding out that Abby would have transposition of the great arteries. Um, we're just putting together some short videos for any future parents that might run into similar diagnosis just to um, share kind of our experiences even though they're going to be different from theirs. Um, but I just remember getting that diagnosis and not really having a lot of resources as far as personal testimonial videos or anything like that. So hopefully this is going to help someone out there. Abby is now seven months old. It is July, oh gosh, 15th, <laughs> and we are now at a point where um, she's going in for echoes every like three to four months, um, or I guess closer to like two to three months, but um, it has been three months so far. So she has one in a week or two. And I think in the first part of the video, we stopped at getting the diagnosis. Um, so, again, we got the diagnosis of transposition of the great arteries, which is um, kind of referred to as a heart plumbing issue. The vessels in the heart aren't pointing in the right direction, and so instead of pumping blood throughout the body, um, it pumps blood or oxygen back out to the lungs and the blood from the body back into the body. So it, there's not an exchange there. Um, so once we got the diagnosis, we were set up with a great team at Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh and also a team at McGee Hospital, which is where I would give birth. And basically the plan was for me to go with Alex, my husband, um, to McGee whenever we were in labor which is about an hour away from where we live, and then give birth. Um, and once Abby would be born, she would go pretty much immediately to Children's Hospital, um, where they would assess her and then determine a surgery date. We had probably seven ultrasounds in between, or seven ultrasounds total, so from the first anatomy ultrasound to getting sent to a secondary um, ultrasound uh, more in depth uh, level two to figure out the diagnosis and then a third um, the third ultrasound was to get an echo of her heart to get a better diagnosis which is where we found the transposition transposition of the great arteries diagnosis and then we had four more checkup ultrasounds between I guess that would be end of August and then when we gave birth in December, very early December. So uh, during that time, I had actually already um, quit my job. So I had a part-time job at this time, so it made it a lot easier to um, go to the appointments. And I honestly, I, wouldn't, I don't know what I would have done if I was working full-time because they're, I'm just going so regularly, either to the regular OB appointments, um, you know, for just regular care, like checking your blood pressure and your weight yeah. and baby's heartbeat, um, but also on top of that, the regular ultrasounds and echoes in Pittsburgh, which is a full day event, you know. Um, so I remember the first time we went back to children, or back to McGee, after the diagnosis, they had a full day set up with us. And we started out talking to the cardiologist team and get a better getting a better understanding of what the diagnosis was. And then after that, we talked to, um, oh, and that included an echo. And then we got another anatomy ultrasound to make sure Abby's limbs were growing and there weren't any other diagnoses that were maybe missed. Yeah. And then after the anatomy ultrasound, we met with the genetics team and they kind of talked us through what would happen immediately after birth. So the genetic testing that would happen and just the different courses 
of action that would take place based on what they would see once she was born. Because, it, again, from the first part, we didn't have an amniocentesis. So they had ruled out a high risk for trisomy 18, but we were still not sure if there were any other genetic conditions that Abby would have aside, uh, have aside from the heart condition. So we talked to them about all those options and determined that immediately after birth she would be given what's called prostaglandins and those would help keep the valve in her heart that babies have in utero and keep it open so typically it closes after birth um, in order for all the functioning parts of your body to begin working as they should when you're living on your own but in her case and in the case of a lot of heart patients um, congenital heart patients they wanted to keep that valve open as another way for her to get oxygen before they were able to fix the plumbing with surgery. So that was the plan. It was a little confusing at the time just because you're getting all this information thrown at you basically in one day. So I had done a ton of research and I felt like I was prepared for the day to figure out what all we were going to hear. But you know, you get there and you're talking to three different teams of people, um, and it's all just very confusing. So we took a lot of notes, but uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Do you see yourself? That's so fun. We took a lot of notes, but overall it was, it was a lot of information. Um, so we just continued. There were a few scares I had, you know, just being pregnant and knowing that your baby has a heart issue. I was really nervous the whole um, half, second half of the pregnancy after we found out just that she was like she wasn't able to breathe because I didn't understand how well she was getting oxygen. Um, you know, now I understand that in utero I was supplying oxygen for her, so it wasn't a huge deal to her at the time. She had a like a slightly smaller growth rate than normal because she didn't have as much oxygen, I guess, but she was getting a good amount. So, um, I wish I hadn't aborted so much, but that was something I just had to pray a lot about and lean on God a lot. And then also friends because he really provided us with a great community in this whole season. We had our pastor and his wife pray over us the night we got the, or the next day after we got the diagnosis. Um, initially, and uh, he had actually had experience with a heart defect, so it was incredible ministry to just be able to hear his story and um, kind of be in a similar season. And then I had a doula that we had hired um, who's a, a friend, and she ended up just being a huge source of comfort to me. Just, you know, anytime I had a question, I would reach out to her, and she would help me. And then I had one day where I couldn't feel... Abby kick and so I it was right after the diagnosis and I was really worried that um, she wasn't kicking so I contacted my friend and uh, as a doula she offered to um, have me come over and check with a Doppler and then ended up taking me to a midwife um, friend that she had and they checked with the Doppler and were able to find Abby's heartbeat so that was really assuring and um, just a really wonderful thing for my heart to feel supported in that way because I was freaking out all the time and just wanted to make sure that if anything was happening I got to the hospital with enough time for Abby to be born even if it was super early um, so but thankfully Abby stayed in there um, a long time and we made it to 37 weeks we had several ultrasounds in between and then at 37 weeks we went in for our final ultrasound we went to McGee and they took the echo and the ultrasound and saw that my amniotic fluid was really low um, they couldn't exactly figure out how much Abby had but it was low enough to where they would be concerned to let me go back home so Thankfully, we had the car packed, um, and we had most of everything that we needed, but um, 
they told us, you know, they wanted to induce us that day. We were 37 weeks exactly. And they said, you're technically full term today, so we want to go ahead and um, do the induction. Because if you do have amniotic fluid and you continue um, go home and something were to go wrong, then, you know, you have a higher risk of uh, stillbirth and other issues coming up. So my husband Alex just went home to drop off our dog at our cousin's house and then came back and they went ahead and started me on the induction method. I had, let's see, first I had um, misopropyl that was started and then um, Actually, let me go get the, I have a better list of what all, 